that that is the truth. I, I've been getting uh, emails in. I've got one from you I haven't read entirely. I figure since I'll have you on, you could uh, explain it to me. But uh, I hear China is actually dumping gold. I've heard that some cities have uh, dropped the U.S. dollar. I see that uh, Jamie Diamond, uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, has uh, faces a $1.7 billion criminal penalty, the largest ever under the Bank Secrecy Act. And that's because of something of his uh, ties there with... Uh, Madoff, whose victims lost 18 billion. What's uh, what's uh, happening here, from from your viewpoint, from your expertise? What's going on? Well, just as uh, we titled the show, um, <laughs> <laughs> things are breaking out, and this is really all very good. It's very encouraging. Um, what's been going on is that uh, you know as the story that I've been telling and other whistleblowers have been telling gets spread further. You know, we're talking about a colossal cover-up of corruption. And as the story spreads, it's kind of like, um, you know, the, the thing about a vicious cycle? We're in a virtuous cycle. The more people that learn about the corruption that we're reporting, the more people come and give additional information and so the crooks whose um, whole scam depends on total absolute secrecy, it's just unraveling one thing after another. And um, we're just having a lot of fun um, just helping each other. The whistleblowers are all um, feeding each other information. And so I'm trying to remember exactly where we were uh, the last time I was on your show, but there's been a lot of progress recently so maybe i'll just start dealing with the very recent progress because i know you haven't heard about that and you know we can talk about next steps and where we go from here okay. it's very exciting it's really wonderful all right yeah. the floor is yours darling uh, go right ahead okay uh well uh one of the recent things that i got was, you know, we have two constitutions, right? Uh, the second one was written right after the Civil War. This was after they assassinated Abraham Lincoln. And uh, the people that assassinated him, we always knew it was the Jesuits. But one of the recent things that happened is uh, Gambini got out of jail, and um, he had been in there for 20 years. He waited till he was out. And then he said, uh, you know, Kennedy's assassination, well, the kill shot was from the mafia. It was somebody who was in a sewer, you know, lifted the sewer cap and killed the president. And we were put up to it by the Jesuits. <laughs> this, you know, this is like a week or so old. Of course, it's not in the mainstream media. But when you get that kind of a statement, which, uh, you know, there's um, every reason to think that the mafia knows who's winning, they're not going to take the side of the losers, are they? So this is a pretty strong indictment. Now let's let's look pretty closely about what was going on with um, John F. Kennedy 10 days before his assassination. That was when he signed something called the Green-Hilton Agreement, Hilton as in Hilton the bank. Um, and in that agreement, Kennedy was going to be issuing currency directly by the United States, by the Treasury Department, and not by the Federal Reserve System. He did that. I have one of those bills, $5 bill in my pocket, red seal on it, not a green seal, says United States notes. And by the way, that was the, uh, the first, Johnson's first official act was recalling that money after he got on the plane. Yeah. Yeah, I have a little bit to say about our friend Johnson, um, but I'll save that a little bit later. But let's let's get back to the thing, the difference between when you have something called Federal Reserve notes, which is what our current dollars are, or whether you have money that's issued by the Treasury Department. When the money's issued by the Treasury Department, 
you don't have to pay any interest on it. So, you know, when people complain about the U.S. debt and how it's growing and how it's never going to get repaid, that's because there's interest on interest that's being compounded. And what the banks do, the Federal Reserve System, when they print those dollars, first they get notes. That's a promise to repay. Who's going to do the repaying? It's us taxpayers. When the Federal Reserve System was enacted in 1913, that was the same time they enacted the Internal Revenue Service. And the purpose of the Internal Revenue Service was so that we Americans would have to pay the Federal Reserve for printing our own money. No thank you. And President Wilson, when he did that, when he signed that law into existence on his deathbed, he, he had some real, um, he was very contrite. He knew what a terrible thing he had done to this country. So anyway, um, the, when John F. Kennedy signed the Green Hilton Agreement, he had the dollars that were going to be issued by the Treasury Department pre-printed, they're uncut, they're in a bank, and all that has to happen is that bank has to listen to we the people because the um, authorized signatory for that account where the uncut treasury dollars are, I'm in touch with this man. He just sent me um, an email this morning. We, we trade emails three, four times a day. His name is Wolfgang Strzok. He's um, living in the Philippines, which is where much of the world's gold is. And that's because um, when Queen Victoria became Queen of England, she had a twin brother who was shipped off to the Philippines. Um, his name was Talano, Prince Talano, because, you know, the people in the court didn't like him. He was, you know, a bit of a scad. Uh, he, he ran around the world having illegitimate children. Uh, one of the, his children is General Yamashita, who is the Japanese general who buried all of this gold. Um, another of his children is Adolf Hitler, believe it or not. And Adolf Hitler grew up in the Philippines. That's why his German had an accent to it. But anyway, um, let's get back to the United States and our dollars. The Federal Reserve notes are not creditworthy. They're going down. The, um, the thing where the Federal Reserve says they're um, doing quantitative easing, they just invent funny words. They're simply printing dollars with absolutely no backing on them. And the thing about the U.S. Treasury dollars that John F. Kennedy was about to issue, those were going to be backed by gold. He, uh, Kennedy had agreed with the man who was the trustee for something called the Global Collateral Account. That's where the world's gold is. All of the world's gold. It's much more than people know exists. Uh, the World Gold Council has um, numbers that are very much deflated. There is 170,500 metric tons of gold a certificate, I believe it is, in the Bank of Hawaii. And the um, Wolfgang Strzok has agreed that this gold will back the Treasury notes that are going to be issued. And we're going to take back the Federal Reserve notes. They're going to be, um, you know, traded dollar for dollar. We're just going to um, take them back. It's not like you have to um, worry about the, the currency. We have to we have to come up with um, a means for um, how we're going to work this transition. Um, but I sent Clay um, an email that I had sent to all of the representatives of the 188 member countries on the World Bank board, telling them about this because uh, somebody had sent me um, an email asking me what they should do with some um, bonds that the German government had issued um, in order to finance World War I and World War II, what Germany did was they issued bonds saying that they would repay the debt in gold. And these people had some of these bonds, and they said, we're willing to sell these bonds back to the German government um, at a discount, and um, could you tell us how we can get this deal done? We understand Germany's buying these bonds back from other people and we want to get in line. And so I wrote an answer to that um, person who sent me the question. The answer went as follows. 
says, remember when Germany asked the Federal Reserve System if they could see the gold that they gave to the United States for safekeeping, um, and states wouldn't even see their own gold. So, Karen, we just broke up there. A year ago. Okay. Said, I looked at the book. He didn't say I looked at the gold. He said, I looked at the book, and we think Germany's gold is okay. And Germany said, you know, that opinion doesn't really make us very comfortable. We would rather have our gold. And so the Federal Reserve said, we'll give you the gold in um, seven years. And, and then they didn't even make uh, transfer enough gold to Germany that they were supposed to give over the seven-year period. And um, one of the uh, journalists, that I respect a lot um, is the guy who I think has done one of the best articles on me, um, Lars Schall, went and looked at the gold that he got back, that Germany got back from the Federal Reserve. And the gold that Germany had given to the Federal Reserve had a stamp of the German government on it. And the gold that the Federal Reserve gave back to Germany was different gold. It was not what Germany had given. So they didn't take Germany's gold and keep it for safekeeping. It's kind of like the teller who takes somebody's money and runs out of the bank with it and, you know, gambles with it and brings it back the next day. You're not supposed to do that. That's a no-no. So anyway, um, so I'm, I reminded the person who was asking me about these German bonds, the fact that the Federal Reserve was not giving Germany back its gold. And nobody told the Federal Reserve they had seven years to give back the gold. It's an act of war. Somebody gives you their gold for safekeeping and they want it back, you better give it back to them. So um, I reminded that person that um, we're about to lose one of our most important allies. I mean, it wasn't such a good thing when Germany wasn't our ally, in case people have a short memory. Um, anyway, so that was how I started off the email that Clay has a copy of. And I said that there is a lot of um, uncertainty about this paper currency. And there is the world's gold that is simply being hoarded by these same criminal bankers that aren't, that, you know, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. When somebody gives you something for safekeeping, you don't refuse to give it back. You know, you, you have no right to refuse audits, which they do. And to make matters worse, there's the world's gold that they're sitting on and refusing to release to the authorized signatory. Now, I've had, you know, I've been making this statement repeatedly, and in the period of time that I've been making this statement, I've had all kinds of strange correspondence. First of all, there's something called the Office of International Treasury Control, that the OICC, that invented itself and said it was the, the right entity that should be dealing with the world's gold. It, uh, you know, that's kind of like pulling yourself up by the bootstrap. Anyway, this group sent me a letter, um, and they said, this is going to be very interesting to you. And I said, well, I don't mind reading it. I said, but is there any strings attached to this correspondence? They said, yeah, there's a secrecy agreement. I said, well, you can have it right back. I said, because I'm not keeping any secrets. In case you hadn't noticed, I don't like secrets. I don't like secret societies. I don't like the Knights of Malta, you know, and, and don't send me correspondence and expect me to keep my mouth shut. So I sent it right back to them. And then um, I got a phone call just before Thanksgiving. I was buying a turkey, <laughs> and I got a phone call from a turkey. His name was uh, Raymond Bennell. He claimed that he was um, authorized to speak for the Philippine people. I said, well, I, I used to work on the Philippines, and I don't, you know, I've got some good friends there still. I'll call them and see if they know you and if they want you to speak for him, so for them. So anyway, he started writing me all kinds of garbage about this goal and saying that, you know, I could keep half of it on behalf of humanity, and the people he was representing were going to keep half of it. I said, you're not entitled to any of it. He said, and you're not representing the Philippine people either, and you can see that correspondence. It went back and forth for a while, you know. 
You sure um, that, you I think he's actually representing the Queen. Karen, you, sh you sure this guy wasn't from Nigeria? Yeah, I'm sure. He was a senior <laughs> official from Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank. Okay. Look him up, Randy Bennell. Sound like, sound just like the, uh, sound like the, the whole Nigerian scam, you know. We got all this gold here. It's in a package. You just need to send us 500 bucks, and uh, you can keep uh, half of it. No, Clay, this is real gold. There are pictures of it. There, you know, it's, it's absolutely rare. Sometimes that people are not having the use of their gold, and it belongs to all of the citizens of the world. People are earning vast fortunes on it. Have you heard about the trading platforms? That's what's funding those trading platforms. The world gold that they're refusing to release. Okay, so th th I'm not making it up. It's real, and they're real crooks. Okay, so that's this Raymond Bennell fellow who's been bugging me. I even got, you know, I mean, don't don't blame me for this. I've been corresponding with with somebody who claims he's Jesus Christ. I told him where to get off too. I said, you know, I I I with all due respect, if you're not talking about the Knights of Malta that you're not talking about the Vatican correctly. And so you're obviously um, there to make everybody confused, and I don't want anything to do with you, and take my name out of your stupid video. And, and he ultimately had to edit, edit this video. But anyway, so that's, you know, that's part of what's going on. But I think one of the most exciting developments is what's going on with um, the Article 5 Convention. You know, under the Constitution, we're entitled to a constitutional convention. And a lot of people are saying, well, we shouldn't risk it because the crooks that are making our lives so miserable have made us so feeble and dim-witted that we won't be able to see what's going on and understand it at the Constitutional Convention. And, you know, the, the people in Iceland had a Constitutional Convention, and they managed to pull it off just fine, thank you. So I've been in touch with um, some of the people in the U.S. Congress, and I've also been in touch with the state legislatures, because uh, more than two-thirds of the state legislatures have called for the conference, and there's absolutely no leeway whether or not they're going to call it. They have to convene it. And the um, clerk of the House of um, Representatives is just derelict in her duties. That's um, a Ms. Haas. So I've been tickling Ms. Haas a little bit about this. Um, and one of the other really interesting things that happened is um, I got a letter that was delivered by the U.S. Postal Service with a three-cent stamp. And I turned around and sent um, a confirmation letter saying I had duly received that letter. Now, the way that happened is because, remember we were talking about Lincoln getting assassinated and the Postal Service? So um, the Congress has never been duly convened after it was sent home from the Civil War. And the postal rate that was by the Congress, the 37th Congress, was three cents. So if you put the right um, um, wording on your envelope and say this is being delivered according to the postal rate of the, that was set by the U.S. Congress before they were disbanded. And then what happened was, remember, we had that second secret constitution where instead of having a Congress that's duly elected by the people, the people that come to Congress are told that they're managers of a corporation in the District of Columbia with all capital letters. And then when you have a birth certificate, um, your child's name is in all capital letters. It's not that their typewriter got stuck. They're doing that deliberately because they're treating you as if you were a thing, not a human being. And they're taking all of the money that they think you're going to pay in taxes or your in taxes, and they're issuing bonds on the capital markets and earning money on your back as if you were a piece of cattle or a ship. And when you go into the courtroom, the judge that's sitting there has a flag with yellow fringe around it. That's not for decoration. That's to put you on notice that that judge is sitting there to, to hoodwink you and snooker you 
and prevent you from asserting your rights as a U.S. citizen. And so I, you know, I, um, I make it sound like I'm doing all of this stuff, but I'm just sort of sitting here collating all of the mail that comes in from people who have spent their whole lifetime researching this. And one of the documents that I got was um, a group of researchers in 1995 went in Carolina into their state court records, not just court, their governor's records, and they saw how the Constitution of Carolina had been after this fake U.S. Constitution came into place so that we would be left without any rights as citizens. And so our courts would be totally turned upside down. Another person sent me um, the um, link to a very interesting article that was written by a federal judge. It said, um, retired federal judge spills the beans. And you, you ought to read that for an eye-opener. Um, so, in other words, I'm just giving you um, all of the different mosaic pieces that come in, and then I work together with other whistleblowers trying to figure out where this whole big puzzle in this grand scheme of things, these pieces fit. And I can tell you the puzzle is getting to be really coherent. You know when you do a puzzle that has lots of little sticky pieces and you've done the border and then you're trying to get the thing to work. When you have all but a few missing pieces, you get a very accurate picture. And that's where we are. And all of the pieces of the puzzle that are coming in, you know, they line up. And so when I got that three-cent letter with the three-cent postage on it saying we haven't had a constitutional Congress since the Civil War, and then I was reading an article about how the Jesuits created the Civil War, how they deliberately went to the, the uh, states in the South to tell them that there was a lot of financing for them if they would just secede from the Union. And then if you read what uh, Abraham Lincoln had to say about the Jesuits, um, it's coming into very clear focus how we, um, they, want, they didn't want a big, strong country. They wanted a country that they could divide and conquer. And they've been doing the same thing, and now they've been pitting you know, every, every group that they can get mad at each other, they've been doing. You know, I'm, I'm not going to repeat all of this stuff, because everybody knows who they're supposed to hate. The, the horrible things that they're learning about their neighbors, so they can hate them, and so we can have a weak country. Yeah, and so you can, re you can report them. You can, do, you can snitch on your neighbors. That's what they're trying to do. And you got, we, got the, we got these people, they come into the, air, into the chat room all the time. Oh, you know, Clay does this, Clay said that, he's got on that, you know, just just anything they can do to spread hate, to spread dissension, to spread uh, fear. You know, they, they want you to be afraid here. They don't want you realizing the power that we got if we work together. But that's the whole thing, Clay. We are working together, and I have to tell you what's going on with our allies, too. That's how come we're not in war in Syria. That, it was, that was on their playbook to have a war in Syria. And it didn't, you know, you saw what the UK Parliament said about that war. They said, we don't believe that, you know, malarkey you're giving us about sarin gas. And we're not going to go there. We're not going to do that. We've already seen what happened in the war in Iraq, and we're not in for the war in Syria. And if you go back and you read the records of some of these um, neocons talking about the seven countries in the Middle East they want to have war in. And they're just coming up with all of the different excuses to get us to believe that that was something we were supposed to do. And we're not falling for it anymore. This is, um, this is the first time that we have not fallen into a banker's war. Um, they don't, you know, they, and a lot of people don't understand what happened in, um, again, talking about Charleston, where we were talking about those researchers in the, the um, state capitol. Well, there was supposed to be a nuclear bomb on Charleston on the 8th of October. It detonated 600 and two of the um, senior military officials who blew the whistle and prevented that bomb from landing on the heads of the citizens in Charleston got fired. These heroes got fired. And, you know, people have been writing to me saying, well, how can you prove that this happened? And it just turns out that the um, 
seismographic record showing this um, disturbance, it didn't look like an earthquake. Earthquakes have gradual buildup, and this was sudden because this was a bomb. You can tell it was not an earthquake, and it was 600 miles off the coast of Charleston. Anyway, so after after these two, and I was going to um, get myself prepared for your program, Clay, and I'm sorry I didn't. I wrote an article in Before It's News, and I mentioned the names of these American heroes, but I don't have them for your radio show. But um, if you want after the show, we can put some links up so people can see who saved the lives of the citizens of Charleston. These banksters had the nerve to think that our military was going to sit back and let them detonate a nuclear bomb on Charleston. That's, you know, that's what we're dealing with here. Now, I've had uh, uh, two, two ex-generals, or actually one general, one colonel, that's calling for a march on Washington by a million citizens to arrest these traitors. Now, we've had the Federal Reserve in existence for a hundred years. Everybody that uh, of significant intelligence in the early <coughs> 30s and 20s warned about the Banks, I mean, even Thomas Jefferson, I mean, one of my favorite quotes here that I use all the time is Jefferson said, if you ever allow a private bank to issue your money, the them the will leave your children homeless in the land of Wisconsin. That's right. But, Clay, you know, um, one of the things I've been learning uh, in this in this saga that um, that I've been involved in since I started blowing the whistle. And by the way, when I blew the whistle from inside the World Bank, I didn't understand that we were talking about world corruption. I didn't understand that we were talking about a Congress that was going to allow itself to have two constitutions and refuse to give the people a constitutional uh, convention. I didn't understand any of this. It's just that um, I have stuck with the problem, and at each level I've you know pushed until I got the thing clarified and then found out that there was another, it's kind of like peeling an onion, that there was another level of corruption that was further along. So that's, you know, that's how I've gotten involved in all of this. And w one of the lessons that I've learned is that people are helpful in agreeing with what the problem is, and then all of a sudden they pull a solution on you that's just exactly what you don't need. That's and called Hegelian. That's called where the banksters are looking for any excuse to declare martial law. People marching on Washington is designed to disrupt. I mean, I used to I used to be uh, one of these people that went to Woodstock, and I know what agent provocateurs are. And when you have a crowd like that, and these people are very good at it, they will you know it starts out as a peaceful march, and all of a sudden you've got rioting going on, and then you've got to clamp down. And there's no way, even though you, you plan for it and you have proctors, these people are very good at getting things disrupted and out of control. So I agree that people need to know what's going on. But when we're entitled to a constitutional convention, why are we marching? Why aren't we just firing the Fed in our constitutional convention? All for. Why are we delaying this? We don't have to delay it. What we have to do is we have to make a real stink about this clerk in the House of Representatives who's definitely not doing their job. She took an oath of office. She's not fulfilling her oath of office. Oops, the case, she's out. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be saying to these people, oops, the case, you're out. This was your job. It was very simple. You didn't do it. You've got no excuse. You're gone. You're history. That's, we, you know, we need to be smart about what the result is of this problem because the problem is it's really a very simple manageable problem because we're not dealing with this problem alone in the United States. We're dealing with it in every single country because these Jesuits have infiltrated every single country. But some of the countries have been smarter or luckier than others and they're not as infiltrated. And one of the countries infiltrated is the U.S. I'm sorry, that's ancient history, the Soviet Union. And they, you know what they did with their Jesuits a year ago? What's that? Those guys didn't make it home. They're not sending any more Jesuits to uh, Russia anymore. So, um, and it's not that 
Russia is backing me. I mean, as I've said on other broadcasts, I'm an ornery critter, and I'm going to do what I want to do because I want to do it. Um, and that's just the way it is. So I'm not here um, as a foreign anything. I'm, you know, U.S. citizen, but it just so happens that what I'm pushing for is something that the Army and the military in Russia and the military in China also agrees with. They don't want these Jesuits running in the world to steal the gold from everybody. They can't. By the way, they're, is, you know, their is, days let, are over. Let me, let's, let me ask you this. Is there gold in Fort Knox, or did they rip that off a long time ago? And wasn't this Germany, uh, gold for Germany? Uh, there was gold that was supposedly sent overseas that was simply gold-plated titanium. What about that? Okay, that was that was different different gold. The, the gold-plated titanium. I forget who who was the lucky um, person that, or country that got that. But I have no idea how much gold is left in Fort Knox. Um, I do know that somebody wanted me to trip up in that, and they were saying that uh, the gold in Fort Knox was being loaded on ships in a week. They, you know, somebody went on my Facebook page to tell me that, to think I was going to fall for that trap. No, I, you know, I have no idea how much gold is in Fort Knox. Um, I have no idea what's going on in the Federal Reserve, but frankly, I don't really care because those people lost the right to be the Central Bank of the United States a long, long time ago, and we just simply have to get the job done now. I think enough people know what they're really up about. And let me just repeat what I've said on the other show, which is um, there's a group of mathematicians at the Federal Institute of Technology that analyzed who it is that owns and controls the capital markets. And they found out that there is a secret group that didn't want anybody to know about their existence that has ten times the power that they're entitled to because they named the same director on the boards of all of these companies. So they have control over 40% of the net worth of all of the 43,000 companies traded on the world's capital markets, and they have 60% of the net earnings every year. And they're, um, you know, like the game of Monopoly, they're, um, the SEC is just sitting there like window dressing. What happened with Bernie Madoff and what you were just um, mentioning um, the SEC, you know, I went to the SEC so many times, and the serious fraud office of the United Kingdom called up the SEC because the World Bank was not giving accurate financial information to its bondholders. I bought a World Bank bond that gave me the right to sue the World Bank and KPMG for improper auditing practices. And that lawsuit was settled by 188 ministers of finance. And that's what's giving me the, whatever it is, the right to keep raising this. You know, I copy, when I copy all of these executive directors, and they know now I'm getting through to the citizens in their countries, everybody knows that we are cleaning out these central bankers because these central bankers could only keep their power what they were doing was in secret. And it's not secret anymore. They are fully exposed. They are now in the same position of a two-year-old that puts a blanket on its head and thinks it's invisible. Hey, Federal Reserve, you're not invisible. Enough people know that you are nothing more than a bunch of crooks. Now, and the, we don't want you. the Federal Reserve and the foundation of the Federal Reserve uh, goes back, and we I've traced it pretty well in the uh, my book, Mystery Babylon, to the Rothschilds, to the uh, central banks here. And the Rothschilds, took over the banking for the Vatican almost a hundred years ago, about the same time they bought the uh, uh, some of the press. They bought uh, our, our uh, routers, or rather they bought routers. Do right, you? that is why people don't know what's going on, because these crooks have bought up the mainstream media, and any journalist that wants to tell people what's really true is getting fired. That's why. Um, well, if they're lucky, Obama, if uh, if they're lucky, some of some of them get blown the hell up. You know, like uh, exactly. That's that's the that's the way they go. Just you know, intimidate people. Um, and if you can't intimidate them, uh, put somebody sexy near them and say.
see if they're, you know, too loose. I can't tell you the really hunky guys that all of a sudden found me very attractive when, when I was 20, and I would have liked these guys' attention, I was nowhere with them. All of a sudden, I couldn't have been sexier. No, I wasn't going to be stupid like Assange, or however you pronounce his name. I wasn't going to fall for that trip. But there are a lot of people that have gotten sucked into honeypots, and they say that that is what we're dealing with when we talk about our chief justice. They say he has a weakness for little boys. And that's why we were, we're getting Obamacare enacted at the last minute. And that's, you know, I've written, I've written to the chief justice many times. I told him that the court system in the United States has lost, that the people have lost all respect for the uh, federal courts because of his shenanigans. He knows very well. But, you know, people, some people have no resistance. And, and so that's, that's the way it's done. And we, the country, are left holding the bag because of this. No, we're not. We're, we've wised up. We're entitled to a constitutional convention, and one of the things we're going to be looking at is the court and the Supreme Court. I don't think we want the Supreme Court doing what it's been doing to us anymore. I don't think we're going to give them the job back. I think they've lost our respect. Well, we, you know, Kathy O'Brien, I interviewed her. She wrote, uh, and I sold uh, quite a few copies of uh, Transformation of America. And she talked about George Bush. He had a thing for little girls. He molested her daughter. And, oh, yes. And uh, <coughs> Dick Cheney was her handler. I mean, she, she was used as a drug mule to bring... Uh, uh, George Bush Sr., he was a little fond of heroin. Uh, that's why he uh, threw up on a Japanese minister. Now, let me ask you about Japan. You know, what what they have done and, and what they, I mean, they wrote it in stone, Garen. They want to reduce the world's population to a manageable 500 million. They wrote that in the Georgia Guidestone. The uh, whole uh, Gulf, uh, and, and I've told people that any time a communist regime when they uh, when they uh, take over a country, they go after three classes of people. They go after the farmers first because they don't want you uh, being able to feed yourself. They don't want you. Uh, uh, second, they go after intelligentsia, anybody that's smart enough to know what they're trying to do. And uh, third, they go after the veterans and the law enforcement that are loyal to the old regime. And that's happening to our military right now. Yeah. Well, let me let me start off with Japan, but right after that, I want to talk about the testimony that went before the U.S. Congress on mind control. Two young girls that risked their lives on that. But first, let's talk about Fukushima and Japan. <coughs> that that uh, that's an attack on our food supply too. I mean, the the, the fish. Yeah. I have I haven't had sashimi since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. No. That, the, the thing was, um, not only was that tsunami created artificially, deliberately, to punish Japan because Japan was going to be um, extricating itself from the banksters, um, but the other thing was that they put a virus in there, a, I forget what it's called, a stick yes, virus, yes. so yes. that the backup generators could not function so that we would go into meltdown, deliberately. And then instead of cleaning it up and putting concrete over it so it wouldn't get any, um, you know, progress any further, they just let that thing deliberately get worse. And uh, the uh, person who's got the signature authority for the gold um, has informed the people that there's 12,000 metric tons of gold available in Bank of Tokyo and that some of this should go towards remediation of Fukushima and there's um, there's technology that can um, can start to undo some of this nuclear damage and we and we've got a team that's going to spring in there and the distance to go between financing that remediation effort um, and not that's just the banksters that are trying to kill us all so we you know we have we have narrowed down exactly who the, the culpable criminals are and what has to happen between us and them. 
So humanity is closing in on these uh, mysteries. There's no question about that. But let's get back to this business about mind control. Um, this was testimony in 1995. This was two young girls who had, you know, who testified just what was done to them because they were trying to um, get the, them um, in a, a system, and it didn't work. These girls were strong enough to resist the technology that they had and the tools that they had. They tried to train these um, young girls to become assassins because they were attractive. You could see from the testimony. And instead, what these girls did was they went and they testified. There was a Dr. Green in the CIA. He was an ex-Nazi who was um, torturing them to, tr to train them to become trained assassins. And they testified. You can see their testimony. And this testimony, what did we do with it? So as far as I'm concerned, these girls were molested twice. The first time by Dr. Green, and the second time when the American people allowed their Congress to ca gather their testimony and then did nothing but sit on their hands. What is this? Um, how many years from 1995? Almost 20 years. That and these criminals and the CIA is still doing this kind of nonsense? What kind of a country are we that we have girls that testify in front of our Congress and it goes unrequited? This is not a country until and unless we start doing our jobs as citizens. I, you know, I'm just not going to let go of us as people. We are going to demand our due. So that, and, and what's important about the mind control is that these techniques, and what does mind control mean? I've been um, talking to a neuroscientist, and, you know, I don't like to get out ahead myself. I just heard this recently, and I want to have a lot of experts look this over because, you know, I'm not able to talk about this kind of a specialty. But I will say that if what I've been told is correct, we now have got the third and inner core of the onion resolved. It looks like that's where we are. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. And I've learned also, you know, when I just react to what I'm first told, um, that happened, um, and people tried very hard to discredit me with that. I got mixed up about um, uh, Nibiru and Isan, and I, I found out uh, about that I was making a mistake one hour after I made a mistake. I couldn't get that taken down from the Internet, not even two months later. Somebody was, you know, making sure that I looked confused and discredited. So, you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to get ahead of, ahead of myself. Um, I know what I know, and I know what I don't quite know yet, and I don't quite know this last piece yet. But the, the fact of the matter is, I, I think we do know enough about <coughs> what these Jesuits are doing. You <coughs> 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 <laughs> now, now, you know, I've been reporting and uh, I've had guests on talking about Planet X uh, or Nibiru or, or whatever it is. It's a little too far out for me to even. But we are having odd weather. We are having, uh, uh, we just lost seven houses in uh, Brazil into a sinkhole just opened up and ate seven houses evidently God was watching over them because nobody was killed nobody went down with the house they all got to run out so whether whether this is happening or not I don't know but the the I filmed the first Homeland Security meeting and uh, John Brinkerhoff was lecturing law enforcement talking about natural disasters of significant magnitude. And uh, he even mentioned specifically the New Madrid fault line. Now, the New Madrid fault line was the source of uh, the uh, one of the largest earthquakes in the country. Edgar Casey, he, he was right about a lot of things, uh, predicted that uh, we would have an inland sea in Mississippi. And you've got all of these nuclear power plants line in that New Madrid fault line, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority and um, and more there. So the these nuclear power plants 
in, in my research here, I found out that we went with this type of nuclear power plants because they produced uranium, they produced U2, U-235, and they could use that for weapons, for bombs, for atomic bombs, and the other form of nuclear power, and I, I don't have the name of it just off the top of my head right now, this other form of nuclear power was so it didn't, it, it, it wasn't dangerous, I mean, it, uh, because it burnt all of the fuel. There were not any excess fuel rods left over like Fukushima. And, but uh, the, uh, the generals, they wanted the atomic bombs. Now, now, who's making all these atomic bombs? Why does Israel need 500? Why does the uh, Soviet Union have uh, thousands? Why do we have thousands stored there under the mountain there in uh, Albuquerque? Clay, I'm back with you. I just took a little bit of NyQuil. Sorry, sorry, folks. I that, have a that's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm asking about the whole nuclear. Yeah, the I've whole heard nuclear about that, industry. and I have an answer for you. Go ahead. It turns out that where you mine uranium, those mining areas, they're, they're owned by the Queen of England. So is our Social Security. Yep. Yeah, our tax payments go 40% to the city of London and then 60% to the Vatican. I just saw that the Vatican was suing Detroit. They said they still owed them money and they weren't going along with their bankruptcy or something like that. This is a letter from the Holy See. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Pope is, is simply the uh, figurehead kind of like Obama, I guess, and uh, the uh, the real power I've always understood was the black pope, the head of the Jesuits. He's changed over the last, since I ran the articles about him, but... Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got his name, but I don't, I don't like to remember it, so give, give me a second, and I'll get it up on my computer screen. Yeah, here it is. It's Adolfo Nicholas the Superior General of the Society of Jesus. <laughs> okay, that I, wasn't I the same one. That wasn't the one that I was, uh, that I did a story on, put his picture in the Free American Magazine. But, you know, he's probably right, dead by now. They, they change. They change. Yeah, they change. But, uh, what about the Rothschilds? I mean, the Rothschilds, they formed Israel as uh, their own little colony. I've got the quote from uh, Rothschild says, uh, you know, don't tell me how to run my colony. And does, uh, does Israel certainly attack the USS Liberty? Johnson authorized that. Johnson recalled the plane. They tried to sink them. We were five minutes away from nuclear war, putting a nuclear bomb on uh, Egypt at the time. Yeah. Well, I was going to talk a little bit about Johnson, but let's stick with um, the Rothschilds for a little bit. Um, yeah, they these these um, they're Knights of Malta, Order of the Garter. Um, but the thing the thing about them is uh, there are families that are older and that are more senior to them, so they're um, they're not calling the shots. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not making excuses for them. Uh, but, uh, and you know, I've, I've heard something else very recently that I'm still processing. <clears throat> about um, the groups that are deliberately misusing people's, um, people are hardwired, it turns out, to believe in God. That's just the way they're constructed psychologically. And there are people who misuse that uh, wonderful trait to bamboozle them and to take this religious feeling and to cr construct a screen, a false screen, so that people um, get tricked. And, <coughs> and so when you 
have uh, clerics. I mean, if you, if you go back to the scene where um, Jesus, who was a very peaceful man, was was violent in in his dealings with the money changers. He just took what they were doing in in the um, temple, and he just uh, told these people where to get off. You know, I that's that is my that's the way I view Jesus, rather than that whole Catholic scam of Jesus on a instrument of torture they used to kill him. Why should I worship an instrument of torture? Why why would we do that? And, and the Bible tells you not to worship graven images anyway. So what's is that that man hanging on that body hanging on a uh, cross? That ain't the way I think of Jesus. And well, you know, religion is, I've is said, a very personal thing, and and somebody who's who's a person of faith and chooses, um, you know, there are also very wonderful um, members of the Catholic Church yes. who don't know anything about what's going on at the upper echelon. Yes. And so you you've got to um you you've got to make all kinds of distinctions there. Um, because if people think that you're um, 100% anti-clerical, um, then you're you're going to be uh, alienating the very people who you have got to reach. So you, you can't um, you can't paint with the broad brush anywhere in any of this. Um, but but the fact does remain that there is serious rot at the top of the Catholic Church, and there is serious rot in Israel at the top of the government. Been there, there for no been there for a long time. It was the Catholic Church that was pretty much responsible for the genocide of the Indians in South America, at least. And uh, you know, I I've tried to tell people I get I get this a lot. You know, well, you got to talk about the Jews again, like there's something wrong with that. I've said these elite hide behind the Jews. The, uh, the the normal Jews, you know, I don't care who your grandmother slept with. I really don't. And our Constitution, which is uh, finest of its time, it certainly handles that problem about religion. You can worship it any way you want. So if you want to hug a tree, go ahead. Here, I, here you can borrow my tweezers, pull the splinters out. If you want to beat your head against that wailing wall, knock yourself out, man. I'll watch. I'm not going to do it with you. And... Uh, you know, if you uh, if you want to get on your hands and knees and pray for a Cadillac, hey, I'll put in a good word with God so maybe he won't drop it on top of your fat ass. You want to stick your nose in the dirt and your ass up in the air, go right ahead. Maybe I'll shoot the uh, St. Bernard off of you. You know, this is a, uh, you know, to me, God is what is the force that, shapes our DNA that holds our atoms together and he don't look nothing like Charlton Heston. And the people that are here, the the scammers, the uh, control freaks, the elite, they use the Jews, they use the Christians just like John Hagee used the Christians. Hey, send me the money, I'll pray for you. You know, that, to me, that's the scam. That's the con. And it's all about trying to get your money. As far as I'm concerned, the money cha the money changers that Jesus ran out of the temple, they're still with us today. They just changed the name of the temple today. They call it the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, <coughs> International Monetary Fund. And they're still trying to extract that money from your hard work from you. And I don't care, to me, Republicans and Democrats are two wings of the same bird. And the, uh, you can say the thing, same thing for the communist or the fascist. Which is, gee, which is worse? You know, control of the government by corporations or control of the uh, government by communists? I, I, I don't see any difference. I call it tyranny. How about you, Karen? You know, the, this business about divide and conquer, once you know their game and the way they were doing it, and you see how successful they've been 
through the years, it's very clear that we've got to we've got to start doing things a little bit differently. And um, I was going to talk just for a minute about uh, Lyndon Johnson because um, he was Lyndon Johnson was going to jail except for the fact that Kennedy got assassinated because I have a friend who um, she ended up dying of uh, cancer at, at a young age, but her husband had a vending machine business. And Lyndon Johnson's friend and Billy Solvesti was shaking down her husband. Um, and, and so on. And Billy Solvesti and Lyndon Johnson were getting, you know, like got their de deposition. They were going to jail for extortion. So Lyndon Banks Johnson, he was, you know, he was part of the Jesuit um, little control. But if you look now at the government, they, they're, they're up to the same thing. They've got their little agents sitting there. <laughs> and we just have to clean house. You know, we have to be, we have to take back, back our country. Um, I, I've been reading about Israby, um, how American children, um, somebody was saying the reason that women are now being given um, equal employment opportunities was to get the kids away from their mothers they could be indoctrinated at a younger age, which I believe that. I'm not saying that there, that there shouldn't be equal opportunity. I'm saying that children should not be brainwashed. They, sh they should be taught how to think for themselves. And anybody that's listening to this broadcast, <coughs> start listening and start, you know, I mean, it's nice to listen to Clay and I babble on, <coughs> but you have to start doing your own thinking for yourself. And the way to do that is to find people who you know and like and talk to them regularly about things that you need to get to understand. And don't just leave it up to your elected representatives. And certainly don't leave it up to the lawyers. I mean, the, the thing I've been <laughs> discovering is that the lawyers, um, you know, there, there's this really great line. It was invented um, by a lawyer in Texas, the, the word um, gobbledygook. He said it to uh, another, his, his name was Melvin something or other. And he said to this other lawyer, he said, don't give me that gobbledygook. It's just there to confuse. And that's what the lawyers have done, a law that nobody can understand but themselves so they can bamboozle you so that you don't even know that you let, have two constitutions. Let, let me, let you me, have a country with two constitutions and one you know, That I, makes no sense at all. I didn't want, I didn't want to... Uh, uh, for you to take it wrong, I enjoy having you on as my guest, but, uh, you know, as a lawyer, I mean, aren't you, uh, don't you belong to the British, uh, the, the Bar Association, a British accredited registry? I mean, isn't that okay, run I'll from the city of London? Works, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, just a minute, I, uh, you can tell me that in just a second, but uh, one of the people on the chat room says, has a question for you. He says, okay. can Karen describe what sort of action is needed to remedy the conditions of the fascist, fascism national corporation in the United States, which goes back to Abraham Lincoln's declaration of martial law in 1861 and has never been rescinded? Great question. You got, you got people right on top of it. Okay. That's what we're calling for the Constitutional Convention for. Because this business about secret martial law and every year there's another de declaration by the Congress behind closed doors that we don't know anything about saying that we're in a state of emergency so every, that we have no rights whatsoever. Every year, every year, every, year, every president yeah, decided. And that, this, and that this 1861 declaration was never rescinded. And by the way, Americans are viewed as <laughs> foreign, <laughs> foreign, whatever they are, um, we, we've lost our rights as citizens um, as far as the U.S. Congress is concerned. So every single one of those members is sitting there in an act of secrecy and treason. Why is it that our mainstream media is not telling people about where they really stand on things? So, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an absolute good question. And when you say, I should describe... What sorts of action is necessary? I can tell you um, the best answer to that 
is that you all have got to stay involved and stay on top of it. And what I can do is, in the World Bank, they train us so that when we're doing a project, we know whether the project is succeeding or failing. They tell you to look at indicators so you know whether you're on track. So I can give you a couple of indicators, and you stay with it. One indicator is what's happening to the whistleblowers. If the whistleblowers are being punished, then you know you you don't know what's going on. And if you you can't track things if you don't know what's going on. It's all about access to information. So the other indicator is whether either people are completely ignoring the the mainstream media and it withers on the vine and it doesn't exist anymore, or you clean it out and you make sure that the banksters don't own it and control it. I mean, you don't need people sitting there feeding you propaganda and bending your mind and giving you all kinds of false values so that you don't know which end is up. I mean, you've got to clean out your mainstream media. And you, if, you, if you haven't done that, then there's no way that anybody is going to come up with recipes for what needs to happen. You need to stick with it. You need to learn what you need to know. And, you, and if you haven't done your homework as citizens, then that nobody's going to give you a good, clean government at the present. You're not going to get it. You're, you're, you and your children and your children's children are going to be just completely bamboozled. And, and the thing about it is it isn't going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. We are at a point where the fork in the road, there's a very clear fork in the road, is either going to be rule of law or it's going to be um, fascism. And I'm happy to tell you that this very, very accurate, um, it's called the power transition model. I, I learned about it because the man who had developed it for the Department of Defense, Jakob Kugler, he's, um, he was the chair of the political science department in Claremont University. He came to the World Bank, and this was in 2004, and somebody at the World Bank told me about this thing, and I was curious about it. And um, so I took Yasser Kugler with me to Ghana, and we saw why the um, Ghanaians were not getting um, a freedom of information law. The reason why was because the Germans who were financing the project insisted on a perfect law, and the Ghanaians wanted their own law. And what you learn when you're doing law reform is, and this is going to answer the question about um, bar. There are some lawyers who... Um, like to, you know, they're one of the one of the, the good guys, one of the guys, and they like for everybody to think they're a great guy, and so they just go with the flow. And then you get ordinary lawyers like me, who wants to know what's going on. You know, nobody's going to think for me. Nobody's going to tell me that the law is there or it's not. I'm going to find out for myself. And so when I go into a country, I go there and I say to these people, I can show you what other people have done in other places. But if you don't like it, it's not happening here because you people are the ones that live here, and it's your country. And, I, you know, I usually would work on a country for three or four years, and they would test me out to see if I meant what I said. And then after a while, people realized that if I would go from one country to the other, they'd call up the country I came from, and they'd say, yeah, Karen, when she says she's just going to do what it is you want done, that's what's going to happen. And that's what I said to the representative of the Rep Russian government on the board. Because there was a rule inside the World Bank that said the president of the World Bank is going to have the leeway to, do, to propose things, and the board can't propose things itself. It can only vote things up and down. And I said to the board, you're not stuck with that. You better, you know, there's so much corruption going on here. You better tell the president that they can take a back seat to the board. And this is what's written in the article. And so when I went to the representative of the Russian government, I said, make me acting general counsel, and I will just be there to make sure that the board gets its way. I'm not going to have my own ideas about it. If I get out of line, you just tell me where to get off. And I had been at the World Bank for 20 years, and they knew. When I said that, that's what I meant. I was brought into the World Bank by an Egyptian lawyer who had been the general counsel of the um, organization for petroleum exporters. And he, <coughs> he had signed me to Jordan and Yemen, which is where I worked for 10 years. So, um, I, yeah, I'm a member of that bar, but I had no idea what those idiots were up to. But I can tell you that I've been going 
to the American Bar Association very regularly and telling them what a total shambles the legal profession is, not only in the United States, but there's another organization in Sweden that the American Bar Association belongs to. Um, and I have been saying to all of them, there, there is no place in the world for a legal profession that thinks it's there to bamboozle everybody with gobbledygook. So I don't think there should be any more um, board of professional responsibility headed by lawyers. I think people have got to be the ones licensing lawyers. Well, we, we, had, we had a law here. It was called the, uh, I think it was the original 13th Amendment that basically said that uh, if you accepted a title of nobility with the, uh, uh, with the uh, Bar Association, that you were banned from uh, serving in Congress or anything else. And, of course, and you know that, what happened to that amendment, Clay? They buried it. They hid it. They hid it. They did not take it away. They hid it. It's very much still there. And, and the question is whether it should stay there when, when there's the Constitutional Convention. I think it probably should be strengthened. I think so, too. Now, you talked about whistleblowers. In Europe, there are things happening in Europe. Uh, one thing that uh, came across my uh, computer here, came across my desk, is that they're trying to uh, uh, ban heritage seeds. Well, you got to have them treated. you got to have them done this. you got to have the uh, banker's hand in it. And the other thing that's happening is that uh, there's a uh, public relations uh, uh, thing uh, called the... Uh, E-U-C-A-C-H proposition where they're trying to uh, ban chemtrails, electronic weapons, electromagnetic weapons, uh, magnetic weapons, directed energy weapons, geophysical weapons, uh, wave uh, energy weapons, frequency weapons. They're trying to ban all that. And they've got uh, one of the people that is behind this, that's trying to do this, is... Uh, Melanie uh, B R I T S C H A N. She's in Brussels, and on uh, December 30th, 2013, she came home from grocery shopping in a nearby supermarket to find three police officers honing in on her, asking me to state her uh, to state my name as I was trying to open the front door of the building. Then. Uh, they, they arrested her, took her, and, and took her to counseling, took her to mental health, and uh, were trying to book her in this mental health thing. And uh, evidently she got away. She said... Good uh, for her. What's that? I said good for her. She got away. Yeah. yeah, but uh, after being uh, locked up and handcuffed and everything else, and uh, they, they uh, took her away from her home, took her away from her children and everything, uh, and uh, I, I had her whole story here, but I'm not going to go into it. You know, other whistleblowers here locally, there's more news about that, more activists right here in this country, Jack McLam is in intensive care, and uh, I just uh, sent a uh, note to uh, to another uh, gentleman here by the uh, uh, an activist that was arrested in uh, for having a gun in uh, <laughs> in uh, Washington. In Washington, uh, that was, uh, let's see, who was that? Uh, uh, that was Adam Kokesh. Adam Kokesh is going for sentencing. I've asked him to be on, offered to be on my show. He's going for sentencing after being arrested for loading a shotgun on camera on YouTube in Washington, D.C. I don't know, I'm kind of reminded of that Waylon Jennings song about uh, the cops busting into the arresting him for possession of something that was gone. <laughs> well, Clay, I mean, you, you, um, you've been dealing with these people. I was arrested. I was put in handcuffs in a, in a cop car in front of the World Bank in 
<laughs> left to be a spectacle for an hour. Um, and then I was thrown in a in the uh, second precinct um, lockup facility for about an hour. Um, and uh, I mean, I can tell you, <coughs> I'm I'm dealing with all kinds of whistleblowers. I mean, I've been <coughs> relatively lucky in that I, you know, I'm I'm sort of an old cantankerous lady, and I I got to the point where I had been at the World Bank long enough that I'm on pension. So I'm not, you know, my families aren't being penalized um, in that sense. Uh, um, you know, I have a pension still. Um, my heart goes out to whistleblowers and their families who are being punished for doing the right thing. But I can also tell you that dealing with other whistleblowers, that is the biggest joy to be working together with these people um, and to know that you're working for a better future. And I guess the, the, the thing I, I, I keep forgetting to say, and I shouldn't forget it, is that we're winning. This very accurate stakeholder um, power transition model is 90 to 95% accurate. And it predicted back in 2004 that if we would get one country to back us on the rule of law, there was going to be rule of law in the world. And, and that's what happened when Elaine Colville, who, who's Scottish, and I got our statement in the UK um, three times. And I got my testimony up in the um, European Parliament. And one of the guys who had been helping me during the hearings ended up getting fired. You know, and I'm in touch with him every now and then. I mean, his, his, his material situation has certainly worsened. But, you know, that there's a special, um, I don't know, I like to think of butterflies that are fighting to get out of the cocoon. Your wings strengthen with that effort. And I really think that the effort that we're all working on as human beings, you know, we're all passing the torch to each other. Um, something happened to, um, I'm trying to remember now the name of this um, journalist who, who Michael um, Hampton, is that it? The one, Mercedes Benz was, I think it was shot by, um, uh, from the air. It wasn't Hanson. He's, in, uh, he's, he's still alive. He was uh, Hastings, Michael Hastings. Hastings. That's the one I mean. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that you should uh, become a martyr and that whistleblowers deserve to lose their lives. Um, I think that when we band together, and um, especially in the case of when you're trying to um, end the cover up, you're in a pretty strong situation. I mean, something happens to me. That's not going to make the cover up go away. That's only going to blow up the cover up. So. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not particularly worried. I've, you know, I've done my part. If if it, the next day I can't do any more, I've done my part. I don't have to feel like I could have done more. I've pretty much maxed out already. I'm happy to keep on, but um, you know, I think the 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 main thing is that human beings are not hoodwinked anymore. We know exactly what's what and who's who. We've got the whole story out there, and we are taking back no question about it. And that's what that stakeholder, that power transition model said. It said if we got our statement up um, on the UK Parliament website, the world was going to have rule of law. And that's what you all are seeing. You're seeing all of us working together. And, um, no, these, these elites, um, they're the, the skull and bones. You think anybody wants to have their name in skull and bones now? You think that organization is going to deliver anything to them that they want? Forget it. That's an honor that nobody is going to want. Well, these, these people are all about control. They're all about uh, 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 divide and conquer. And we see this happening all the time. We see this all the time. You know, going on right now. Going on right now. You Clay, know. is anybody dividing and conquering us? Well, they try. They try, you know. They try to get me kicked off of the show. They try to get me uh, to uh, kill my voice. I've had, this, I, I've had this happen in cities. I mean, you know, oh, Clay's selling that book. 
place selling that book, Mystery Babylon, to, to, to raise money for a snitch named Wavos. I'm sorry, I don't know any snitch named Wavos. Ain't trying to do it. Ain't try, I, I don't support nobody but me. And I have guests on, and the reason I'm on this Wolf Spirit Radio is because Dave Corso doesn't censor people. So if I want to talk about the Jews, if I want to talk about the Jesuits, you know, you may have the room full of, of Catholics that uh, uh, think we're being, uh, we're, uh, that I'm the Antichrist. You may have a few Jews in the room that are, uh, you know, oh, he's talking about that. He's using the J word again. He's using, uh, so did Jesus. He Jesus said, Beware the Jews who say they're Jews, but are not, or of the synagogue of Satan. And even the Jewish historian, I've got him featured in my first magazine, Benjamin Friedman. He said, he said, uh, the they these there there are Jews out there, so-called Jews out there, so-called Jews. That and and by the way, you know. Whether it was Jews, Jesuits, Illuminati that uh, put down the protocols of the elders of Zion in print, I, I, you know, if you mention the protocols of Zion in around a Jew, he'll start screaming at you. Oh, don't you? That's a forgery! Don't you know that's a forgery? I see. What's a forgery? What's? Oh yeah, it's an exact copy of the original. And whoever wrote it 200 years ago. They're probably dead by now. So it really doesn't matter who wrote it. It matters is who is using that today to build a one world government under Satan, under Lucifer. And, uh, yeah, sovereign, free sovereign. I have allowed Karen to present her information. And uh, all you got to do is if you got a question, I put your question to her, I will put your question to her again. I don't think I prevented her from doing anything, from saying anything. Have I, Karen? No, you certainly haven't. Not at all. Not in the least. So if you've got a question, all you got to do is write it down to ask her. I think she's presented her information pretty well. You know, and I don't know, I personally, I ain't in the back rooms, I don't have anything to do with this. I am an individual, I got my own opinions. I bring other people out there, I try to give you information. And I am going to give you some information here, I'll be, especially on Friday. I will be talking about Jews tomorrow because I'll have John Kaminsky on. And on Friday I'm going to be talking about uh, what I've got up. What I've got up on the uh, my website, freeamerican.com, I've got uh, the, uh, I'm talking about Operation Green Fire. This is the Noah's Ark project, and it's scheduled to be the largest peacetime project in American history, built by a veteran army. They have asked me to work with them to get veterans, and I'm going to take this whole story that I'm going to be writing here, containing all the information that's already on my website. It's already on my website about Operation Green Fire. That is a veterans program, top to bottom, and the first, when the first phase is completed over the next 10 years, it will mean virtually 100% post-military employment of all our 9-11 veterans in some of the nation's most challenging and high-paying careers. In addition, we are making one million of the most advanced homes in the world, the Green Fire Super Home, available only to our veterans and their families and our wounded warriors, with a mortgage co-signed 100% guaranteed for life by the veteran-run Noah's Ark Global Foundation. And, you know, I've told people, it's got up here right on my website, that I conceived of this concept as the Liberty Village concept, and I fully endorse Noah's Ark Project, the mission of a lifetime. 
I'm going to be working with them. I'm going to be promoting this the same way I promoted Indian, the same way I've, uh, you know, promoted my Free American magazine and everything else. Clay, can I put my two cents in here? Absolutely, dear. All right. Um, I don't know how who's financing this um, Veterans Project, but I have a, a suggestion, a friendly amendment, they call it. Okay. And that is, um, I'm assuming that this is not just going to be in one location. It's going to be all around the uh, country, probably. The first location, uh, they've already got, they're closing uh, the uh, in March on speakers in Florida. But it okay. will be all around the country. Okay, the, so maybe they can pilot this in Florida, and it doesn't have to be at the same exact location, but it might help. And that is... There is a way to have a local currency. You and I had discussed this on an earlier show where there was mountain, um, mountain what, what money, called? Mi mile high currency, Ithaca hours. Yeah. What, uh, you do, what you do, you can call it anything you want, is in that local vicinity, all of the businesses agree that they're going to have, it's kind of like a barter system where you get a local currency that can be used in the local businesses. Um, and you can also, you can, you can make it as fancy or as no frills as you want. Some people call it a time bag. But if you also have a, um, a provision in there that the, the chips, whether, you know, whatever symbol you have for that time that you spend or the, um, you know, the, the baker has goods that are worth a certain thing. Anyway, you say that if you don't spend that chip within a month, it loses value. That's the way to get the, the currency to circulate. And if you have the local um, goods that are being provided in the, the house, that's going to in, improve the local employment in that community where the houses are being constructed. But it doesn't have to be tied you know, to that project. It's just one way of making it um, even better for the local area that it's, that it's um, where it's being um, built. Yeah, the uh, all of this information, he's done a pretty good job. He's been working on it, and uh, the man's name is Noah. The The website is projectnoahsark.com, and uh, he's, uh, this is for veterans and by veterans, which is what I've encouraged. I think one of the, uh, one of the things... I mean, I volunteered for Vietnam in 64. I didn't go. And I, uh, I made a living off of selling peace symbols uh, uh, all over the country. Kmart, 7-Eleven, uh, you know, everywhere. I sold them. And uh, so I, I feel like I helped stop uh, illegal war. The Vietnamese people were never a threat. There was no Gulf of Tonkin in incident. And this gentleman is a veteran, and he's got uh, several sections here. The uh, Welcome Home Veterans, About Us, the Green Fire Super Home, the Veterans Green Bank. That uh, and, and he's, uh, I just shared yesterday a letter that he wrote to uh, President Obama, and he's asking the Federal Reserve to uh, help this, to... Uh, Hey, what he's proposing is a 1% loan, which I think kind of escapes the whole usury <coughs> thing. And he wants to finance these homes, these green fire homes. This is a uh, ceramic concrete superstructure with forensic engineering. He said the system was designed to be built by veterans and use a skill very similar to what they use in the military. Close military style teamwork, heavy equipment. Close logistics support, communications, computer skills, fast and easy to install. The superstructure does several things. First, it creates a solid, tightly, tight, highly insulated shell around the home with a world-leading thermal efficiency 95% better than the standard wood wooden home. In other words, these super homes need only 5% of the energy to heat or cool them. Second, engineering, we've discovered that only one type of home survived all earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, and wildfires. We use that engineering in our super homes. And third, this type of system makes it easy and inexpensive.
to create our key bear system as well as our 15,000 gallon rainwater storage tank, both of which are located in the foundation system. So what they're, what they're proposing is a home that is totally self-sufficient that will last for hundreds of years. And I think that's a, a achievable and a good goal. And he wants it built by the veterans. And that's why I'll be putting this story and this information up on Veterans Today. Gordon Duff, Colonel Gordon, Gordon Duff is on my show on a regular basis. And we'll be talking about that with him and have him on very shortly. So this is what I closed with Liberty Villages. And, uh, but they've refined it a lot. I'm not a builder, you know. I'm not a farmer. I mean, I don't, uh, it's not what I do. And uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to get involved with this. I think it's, uh, it's an answer. I'll have to get in touch with him and see what he's, where he's going on that green bank thing. Yeah, well, I can uh, I can give you some of that information here. The uh, Veterans Green Bank. It's a he says the largest middle class in American history began when the returning of World War II GIs took advantage of the newly created GI Bill. The Veterans Green Bank is the citizens version of the GI Bill. It calls for the creation of a new kind of bank public bank, a federally chartered non-profit affirmative green bank, non-profit, that will borrow money directly from the Federal Reserve, the same as the big banks, but at rates of 1% for 60 years, and to pass this loan directly to the veterans owner, the veteran owners of the Green Fire Super Home. He said banking at the national and international level is highly complicated. But at its simplest, the Federal Reserve Bank borrows money directly from the government, loans that money out to the banks and financial institutions at higher rates until it is finally marketed to the public, as mortgages say, 5% for 30 years. The Veterans Green Bank would be a new kind of non-profit bank that is also chartered to borrow directly from the government, guaranteed by the VA, but at a rate of 1% for 60 years, reflecting the longer durability of the Green Fire Super Home. And to pass that loan directly to the veteran homeowners, these loans will not be given to ordinary homes, only to homes that meet the highest energy and environmental standards, such as those represented by our Super Green Fire Home. This kind of loan, with the much higher quality Green Fire Super Home, would be able to financially compete with ordinary wooden homes, this higher quality includes a superstructure of ultra-energy-efficient, nearly indestructible ceramic concrete superstructure built vertically on three levels, including a 2,500-square-foot second-floor luxury home <coughs> with 500-square-foot professional chef's kitchen, private elevator, and a 2,500-square-foot first-floor professional home business level, and a third-floor 3,000 square feet of organic hydroponic greenhouse for homegrown vegetables and fruits. Above the third floor is a special solar rainwater harvesting canopy called a SPARC system with 3,000 square feet of photovoltaic solar panels for a total of 8,000 square feet of living area that will sell for about 600000 including land. With a standard mortgage of 5% for 30 years, the monthly uh, payments would be about $3,220 a month, beyond the range but, uh, of all but a few Americans. If the same home were to be financed with a veteran's green bank, 1%, for 60 years, it would only cost $1,108 a month, well within the financial range of all Americans. The further advantages of the Green Fire Super Home owner these homes have no electric utility bill, no gasoline cost with an electric car, virtually no food expense, very little maintenance, and a very small home insurance bill. These kind of costs could radically change the financial picture for individual American families and for us as a nation. Ownership of these new super homes is the first step in the fundamental wealth program we have created for our veterans. 
How about that? And there's also well, an I can't think there, there, about the technical, you know, it, I can say it sounds big, it sounds beautiful. Um, I don't want the Federal Reserve to exist, so I think it's going to have to come up with another source for its funding. Well, they've got a, they've got a stock offering uh, that they will be doing. They have no stock for sale at this time, but uh, they will probably have a uh, private stock offering uh, now being prepared. Yeah. But it's a plan, you know, and it's based on everything I've said. Now, I, I, you know, I looked at, well, doing cheaper structures, you know, do teepees, do uh, yurts, do uh, uh, earth bag homes. Uh, you know, two classes of people live in uh, adobe homes, the very poor and the very wealthy. And uh, they've taken this a step up. They've taken it a step up, and... Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's probably one of the better plans that I've heard. You know, we're not talking about violence. We're talking about putting veterans to work. And I've said, if, you know, if, if I was doing my Liberty Village thing and had a bunch of teepees there, put six veterans in one teepee, you know, and if they mend the fences, milk the goats, gather the eggs, and would be there to defend the place, you know, that would be a workable arrangement. This takes it a step further. But the the and the uh, the idea of having a house that doesn't have to be connected to the telephone poles and the telephone lines that appeals to me. And all of this is available. Uh, the links are on the uh, website, projectnoahsark.com. They've got an investor's page. They've got uh, you know, business opportunities. They've got uh, a pretty complete website. You know, actually, Clay, what I'm brought back to, I'm brought back to the ingenuity and the vision of this. And I'm, I'm very supportive of that can-do spirit and, you know, wanting things to be better for people. I'm not going to speak to, you know, the housing design or the square footage or any of that. But uh, the longer I stay busy with, with this effort, the more um, concentrated I get into just the actual um, vision that somebody has. Do they have a vision of a world that's um, got a place for everybody? Do they have a vision of a world where people are um, caring for each other? Do they have a vision of a world where, where people are getting to their own potential and they're happy and they're making everybody else in their neighborhood happy? You know, it, it just, it, it all, I think it all really starts with our internal vision. And what, what strikes me about um, all of the effort that we whistleblowers have is that what we're fighting for is we're fighting for room for our vision. Somebody is playing with our minds. Somebody's torturing us so we have a different vision of hu humanity. I mean, they've got to be warped. First of all, they have to be warped to think that we're going to take that. I think, I think they've got another thing coming. I think they're going to find out that hum humanity's vision for humanity has no vision for fascism or one world government. Um, we have a vision for a community where we care for each other. And it sounds like this guy is trying to, you know, through his um, housing, concentrating on housing first, maybe he's trying to make a safe place for people. Um, but I would say that the, the place to start you know, might be more to um, to get our out in terms of just our own vision of ourselves and to get from where we are, which, you know, we're not even seeing the, the fact that people are preventing us from finding out what reality is. 
I mean, that's pretty sick when somebody's spending all their effort to prevent us from finding out what reality is. That's not working. We, you know, some of us know what reality is, and we're telling the others, and those are telling the other ones too. So that's what I think, I think we're invincible, frankly. Um, and we'll get around to our housing, but first we've got to get these idiots that are trying to bamboozle us out of our hair. They just don't belong anywhere. There's no place for them. We see reality. Uh, how do we and do that? I've said, you know, I've said one of the one of the problems w that I have with almost all the plans is how do you fight evil without becoming evil? I mean, I don't, don't want to go out and kill all the Jews. I don't want to kill all the Mexicans. I don't want to kill all the blacks. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to play their games. I don't want to do that. So I look for something different. I look for something different here. Well, it's it's really not that hard, Clay. I mean, you just sit down and talk to the other person until everybody agrees what reality is. That shouldn't be so hard. Reality is reality. It's it's kind of like herding cats here, trying to get patriots to work together. I mean, you can see that right here on the chat room here that I was just uh, looking at. They, uh, they, nobody agrees on nothing. I mean, I don't. I agree with that. The the Federal Reserve is a problem. They're a for-profit bank. They have been uh, taking your money and uh, your taxes and everything for for years. A hundred years. I mean, they were supposed to, their charter was supposed to be over here, but nobody's talking about that. Congress ain't no, talking Clay, about that's, it. That part, no, they didn't, that's not in the law. It wasn't for a hundred years. That, that was just confusion. Okay. But there's nothing that says that they have a right to continue with when we don't want them there. And we have a right to tell them we don't want them there. And that's what the Constitutional Conference is all about. The, the Constitutional Convention. And, and why are we not having one? Who's, you know, who's the idiot that thinks they have a right to prevent us from, you know, the consent of the governed? We're not giving our consent. Two-thirds of the state legislatures have said we need a convention. You've lost our consent. We don't give that consent. And, you know, that's pretty straightforward. I don't, I mean, is there anybody in the chat room that thinks that our consent is given for this government? For this Federal Reserve, they have our consent? They don't have it. It's not there. What are they doing? They, uh, well, you know, they're, they're, this, this gentleman, I mean, first of all, he's, uh, he's a veteran himself. And, uh, he, uh, you know, he wrote a letter to, uh, President Obama. And I was sharing that uh, with the uh, audience yesterday. And uh, I had B.K. Durham on with me, and she hung up because she doesn't like Obama. Well, I don't like Obama much either, but I didn't like Clinton, and I didn't like Bush, and I didn't like the Bush that followed Clinton. How, how far into the program were you before she hung up, Clay? Uh, about an hour. I would, then I started reading this uh, letter that he wrote to Obama outlining this whole project here and uh, she was a little upset at that I mean she uh, she thinks that um, the uh, Durham Trust is what they're using what Jamie Diamond and everybody is using so whether she's right or not I don't know I don't know she's got a piece of paper that's uh, supposedly uh, worth trillions of dollars but in all of the time that um, I've known her, 20 years, she doesn't, they, they've cut her out of her Social Security. They've tried to uh, say that she's dead. They've, uh, they've done whatever they could to hamper her. They killed her husband and all that. So she's had a pretty rough go at it, and I'm not disagreeing. With any she she said, I'm certainly not calling her a liar, or and she's a she's a real smart lady, real smart lady. She's but also helping us figure out what reality is because she's been you know in some of those inner circles and she can tell us what it's like there. I you know I've been in the World Bank, which is one of those 
places that not everybody gets to go, and I'm certainly telling everybody what what's going on there. So, um, I I mean I can I can see where she probably thought she was going to get the whole show devoted to her, and she just didn't want to find out something new and go along with it. That's um, right. And give her two cents along with it, you know. But that's okay. Everybody can do. You know, I'm sure you. <laughs> That wasn't the first time you had to think on your feet. <laughs> no, and I well, certainly, well. certainly didn't. I, I got to devote the rest of the show to uh, this uh, this gentleman's vision, and I think he's got a good vision to have. A, I mean, this is what, in, in a much smaller scale, this is what I propose. Let's put up ten teepees, rent them out, hang a vacancy sign on them, put a yurt in the middle of it, and sell videos, sell uh, solar units, sell this. We got a, I got a solar unit on my uh, website. Cost 500 bucks. Everywhere else, they're a thousand bucks. You can buy this one for 500 bucks. Strap it on the back of a Harley, and uh, find a uh, shelter out on the highway. Set out your solar panels. Plug your computer in. Plug your modem in. Plug your cell phone in. Charge it up. Turn the lights on. And I can do the show at a rest area in the middle of the desert, you know, so that's, uh, and if you put this, uh, juice box on top of the, uh, on top of the, uh, teepee, you can power, you can power everything you need to put, you know, put a solar oven outside to, uh, cook your food, a little 12 volt, uh, refrigerator, and you got more than enough power to run that. But, uh, you know what I'm thinking? The real approach that this country is to it can. I mean, I don't think anybody can take our thought they could, but I just don't see that's where we're going. And I, you know, I, I mean, all power to. Um, uh, it's Victoria, right? What's Durham. That? What's that? I'm trying to remember Durham's first name. Oh, Vina. Yeah. I mean, she's um, she's insisting on her vision too. It's a, it's just a bunch of um, people that you're you're not going to take take them away from themselves. And and this fascism that they thought they were going to get and one currency and one size fits all and two constitutions. They just tried to sell that to the wrong people. We're just handing it right back to them. They are going to be so sorry they tried anything with us as a country. Well, you know, this uh, this whole thing, this plan for the Liberty Village, I had five acres. I had the north half of a uh, little two-house town in New Mexico. And uh, I, I figured, well, it's on our main highway. If people are driving down the highway, they see 10 teepees sitting there and all lit up in a vacancy sign outside and a sign that said hot coffee, they'd pull in a stop. And many people did stop. I had a little store there. I had the old post office. I had a 2,000 square foot home there. And many people magazines, uh, bought videos, bought tapes, and it would have just been the expansion of that. And I thought if if, if we're growing, and I had a garden out there, I had a garden out there, so uh, why uh, why not do it this way? Show people that we can, that we, there is a little different lifestyle, you know, that, that little tune, that uh, little tune uh, said, uh, you know, how are you going to get them back on the farm after they've seen L.A.? And, uh, I think it was Perry. Perry, yes, it was Perry. I changed that. <laughs> but it was, you're right. It was uh, uh, after they've seen Gay Perry. How are you going to get them back on the farm? But uh, the Liberty Village concept was a way to get them back on the farm, to show them that living on that farm could be nice, you know, uh, so living on that farm. Having uh, organic eggs, I certainly had organic uh, meat. I bought it from my neighbor, Vincent Del Cordo, had a ranch right down the street from me. 
And uh, so I had range-fed beef, grass-fed beef, not genetically modified. I had that for for my food. Now, uh, somebody here in the chat room is wondering if you think that Obama is a good guy. I don't, uh, you know, whether, uh, again, my career now passes. To, uh, oh, I, you know, I've been all over the place on that, and um, I've been really educated. The, the group that has educated me the most now recently is something called Able Danger. That's um, a former flyer. Um, fight pilot named um, McConnell, um, Field McConnell, and uh, anyway, he he had um, tried very hard to prevent what happened in 9/11, and so what um, what the, it, it's a group that uh, consists largely of people that you know, sir, veterans and former intelligence um, officials. Anyway. Um, so they've been educating me on what's been going on in that presidency, and um, it is not a pretty picture, Clay. Um, I do have to say that any of the American presidents, after what happened with um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, um, the, these people are vetted by this group, foreign, they're not American but they're trying to get people in that are going to make it possible for them to rule this country secretly by remote control. And uh, so if Barack Obama had uh, an ounce of integrity and was really going to make good on his campaign promises, if he was, it wouldn't have been possible anyway because of who that group is. Uh, you know, so uh, I'll have to say that it was not going to be easy for him. But I also have to say that Are terrible things have happened that just can't be explained. I hear this morning. Hey, Dave. Especially Dave, I can hear yeah. you. You don't have your mic uh, muted. Did you want to come in on the conversation? I'm giving a kind of a winding, long explanation, but let me let me end it with a punch. Okay, go right ahead. we got Some ten minutes inexplicable left. inexplicable things happened to his very own grandmother before he took office. So um, you're not going to find a very, um, you know, I just, I just do have to say that as a lawyer, I don't want to see um, a country where there's no president. I don't want to see a country where there's chaos. I want to see an orderly arrangement. So that's, you know, that's where we are. Well, you know, I... Uh Obama is what we have right now, and I don't see much difference between the Republicans and the Democrats here. If they're if they're working, if they got elected, the media got them elected. We get we donated a uh, billion dollars to the Republican and Democratic parties over the uh, last presidential election, and uh, they. Uh, where did that money go? Where did that money go? It went to the media companies so that they knew who we could vote for. Whether it was and the presidential debate, you know, it, it used to be the League of Women Voters that were in charge of it, and now they've got some kind of a circus where it's just, you know, they're not going to tell American voters what they need to know before the vote. So, I mean, we've got a and, – and besides which, the voting machines don't work either. I mean, the whole thing is – from soup to nuts, it is a big shambles. And, you know, they say that a country gets what they deserve, the government they deserve, and, boy, is that an indictment. Just if I could just say that is an indictment. But, I'm, I, you know, look at what, what um, Mitt Romney was all about. His national security transition planning chief was the former president of the World Bank. <laughs> <coughs> that was a crook. <coughs> now, we've got uh, we got about seven minutes, six minutes left here. Tell me about the World Bank. Now, I've talked about the International Monetary Fund. We've talked about the Bank of England. We've talked about the Federal Reserve. And the, uh, the Rothschilds are 
the custodians of uh, of uh, the Vatican's money. I mean, they're the Vatican's bankers, aren't they? So, what, what about the World Bank? What about the World Bank? I mean, do we? Uh, you were fired for trying to reveal corruption within uh, the World Bank, so they don't want you. They don't want you telling the truth either. So what's the uh, what's the situation with the World Bank? Are they any answers? And you know these people on the uh, chat room are all upset because this uh, this guy uh, this uh, Noah was talking about getting money from the Federal Reserve, just like your Bank of America, just like your local banks here do. I mean, uh, you know, we can't tear the system down entirely. We got to work within the system. And uh, to some extent, if we've got responsible people, honest people that care about the public, uh, you know, we got to do what we got to do to in the framework that we've got here. So that's exactly my point, Clay. I would say that it is a oh, it's a platform. It's a place where you can have a transition to something better. And that the people have to stay involved and make sure they know what is better. Um, the international financial system suffers from something called a democratic deficit. First of all, you don't know what's going on because if anybody on the inside tries to tell you, they get fired. Um, the fact that I'm telling you what happened and the other whistleblowers are telling you what happened. And the U.S. Congress said that the World Bank doesn't get to spend a penny Rabbi. until the effect of retaliation against whistleblowers has been eliminated. Dave, would you mind muting your mic here so I can finish this? Would you mind muting the mic, Dave, so I can get the, the last word here from Karen? I don't need to hear your other friend there, please. Uh, Dave, please mute your mic, please. Uh, is uh, the big guy taken care of? Did he give you a kiss? All right, Karen, they're having yeah. a conversation about dogs over here, so I'm going to let you go here. Okay. We'll just end this a uh, couple of minutes early. Thank you for being okay. on with me. And I'll certainly have have you back. Thanks for having me. Thank Bye you, dear. Bye-bye.